We have come to the end of Paul's wonderful book to the Roman brethren. And so this actually will be our last uh, visit by this means. But I want to be sure to give you thanks and appreciation for the time that you spent with me as we have reviewed uh, this wonderful book. As Paul comes to the end of this letter, he changes from the doctrinal matters that he's dealt with in the previous chapters and turns to some very interesting and personal matters. He's telling the Roman brethren that uh, he's on his way to Jerusalem to deliver a contribution that the Gentile churches had made for the uh, poor saints in Jerusalem who had been affected by serious famine. And he wants them to pray that uh, he will be delivered from his enemies there and that his contribution will be accepted by his Jewish brethren. It actually didn't turn out as Paul and his Roman brethren had prayed. Paul does eventually make it to Rome uh, he said that he was in the letter. He said, I'm going to go to Spain, but I want to stop by and visit with you. For their refreshment and for his, he does make it to Rome. We don't really know if he ever made it to Spain, but he does make it to Rome, not as a free man, as he had planned, but as a prisoner. He concludes this wonderful letter by in chapter 16, by sending greetings, it's amazing, to 26 different individuals by name, in spite of the fact that Paul had never been to Rome. That's remarkable. And what is also remarkable to me is that as he names each one of these 26 individuals that he knows by name and loves, he attaches a complimentary phrase to their name. Look at verse, the latter part of verse 5. He says, Greet my beloved Eponidas. At least three different times in that list, he uses the word beloved. Now, Paul could be firm, straightforward whenever he needed to be, such as he did in the book of Galatians and other places. But basically, Paul seems to have been a very, very affectionate, loving, compassionate individual. And as I said, he uses that word beloved over and over again in the first uh, 16 verses of Romans 16. He also uses the little phrase of certain ones, they have worked hard in the Lord. Others, they have been a great benefit to me. And so for each one of these names, he attaches a short complimentary phrase. And here's what I wonder, my friends. If Paul were addressing a letter to me or you, and he says, greet me or you, I wonder what he would attach to my name. I wonder what he would attach to your name. I wonder what you would want him to attach. I hope it would be positive. I think it would be like uh, all of these in this list. Look at verse 17 and let's start reading there. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. Paul tells us in several places that uh, after his departure, there will be grievous wolves, as he labels them, that will come in trying to teach false doctrine and draw away disciples after them. That was happening then, <clears throat> and I'm sorry to say that it still happens today. We need that warning to watch for those who would do such things and to the best of our ability, avoid them. And then he describes them 
Verse 18 says, For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. The margin says their own bellies. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Again, my friend, that is happening today, as I suspect you know. Of course, not every preacher is doing that, but far too many are. Certainly not every television preacher is doing that, but in my judgment, so many of the preachers on television are doing exactly what Paul describes here. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. And most of the time, it's to get money. The Bible makes it clear that we're not to use the gospel as a means of gaining money. But some do. And the Bible makes it clear that that's wrong. Paul then pays a compliment to the Roman brethren. He says, for your obedience is known to all. I'm glad to see that Paul points out the importance of obedience. Sometimes we're told that faith alone is enough. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches, of course, that faith is important. It comes first. But real biblical faith always, always leads to obedience. And James makes it clear that faith without works, faith without obedience, is dead. Now, we're not saved because of our works, but our works are for the purpose of demonstrating the reality of our faith. And it must be there. So Paul compliments them for their obedience and says that he rejoices over them. I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. We do not know when and how that was fulfilled, but Paul makes them a promise of victory. Next we come to Timothy. Timothy was a great help to the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was with him over and over again. He was left in certain places to set in order the things that needed to be uh, set in order in the congregations that Paul had established. So he's with him now in Corinth as he's on his way to Jerusalem. And he says, Timothy, my fellow worker, greet you. So do Lucius and Jason and so Sipater, my kinsman. Several times in this 16th chapter, Paul refers to someone as his kinsman. I think he's probably referring not to our Christian kinship in Christ, but Paul is actually saying that some of his biological relatives had been converted and he sends greeting from them. Verse 22 says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. That's an interesting note. Paul had what he called a thorn in the flesh, and it's just a guess, but I think a good guess, that Paul probably had poor eyesight. He even says one time, you see how that lar how large letters I use in writing. Therefore, Paul used someone to actually do the writing that he dictated to them. And Tertius was that person in the Roman letter. Verse 23 says, Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. You will notice as you read verse uh, chapter 16 that Paul refers to house churches. For instance, uh, verse 5, the first part of it says, speaking of Priscilla and Aquila, greet also the church in their house. You may already know that the early Christians certainly did not have church buildings like we do today. It was in fact some 300 years before a church building to meet in was constructed. And during the first century, they simply met in individual homes in small groups. And I've often wondered how different it would be and maybe even how much better it would be today rather than our 
Christianity being attached to a building. If we actually met informally in homes. But anyway, that's what took place then. It's interesting. Paul concludes this wonderful letter with what we commonly call a doxology. And I think it would be appropriate as we end our times together by this means that we make that doxology ours. Let's read it together. Verse 25, Now to him, of course, referring to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Now to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. And I say amen to our times together. And again, I thank you for your sharing this time with me. May God bless you for now and forevermore.